Well, come with me. I'm going to consider John chapter 1, excepting uh, verse 6 to 8. Verse 15, not having talked about John the Baptist, he suddenly says, John, bear witness of him. And of course, we immediately think of John the Baptist. And, oh, yes, yes. In other words, in some sense, the writer here is clear you know about John the Baptist from the other accounts, I would think. Or at least you know about John the Baptist, who is actually mentioned in the other three accounts. Okay, we've all received and grace for grace. Now I've been talking about grace and suddenly I found I'm on track with grace here, verse 16. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, now the importance of grace and truth, we normally emphasize, you know, God the Father and love and so on in John, John 17 and that, but here we're talking about but grace and truth came because perhaps we're talking about wisdom now. Wisdom is something or greater than understanding, greater than legality and laws. It's something about grace and truth, something more fundamental and um, well we think the fundamental thing is love and in some ways one of the greatest at least if not the greatest aspect of lo love is this grace if you think of a parent I mean of course they love everything good that the child does but continues loving them even when the child is not up to doing good and doesn't. The, the parent extends grace as well as my son and uh, I'll pay that bill and um, now what can I do to correct him and guide him and lead him? But I mean, he's my son and I love him. I extend grace, you see. Major aspect of love, isn't it? You know, this person's not only should be or could be towards me, but oh, they mean a lot to me. That's all there is to it. I'll excuse them these um, these faults, if you like. I extend grace. How much more, God? Now, what strikes me on this discourse is that we're talking about the Word, verse fourteen. And the Word was made flesh. Now, Word, this is Gnostic language. This is Logos. This is Greek. No, you know, scarcely any question about it. And Greeks are into wisdom. They're not into um, God's being a historical fact. They're into God's being... Um, legend, myth, um, the mystery cult is about um, gods and fables and, you know, it's, it's about, um, it's not about historical flesh persons. Now what we're saying here, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the or an only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, let me pause there a second, because I want to check um, the original. Yes, I'm encouraged to say it is in the original, not got the definite article, not in my um, Greek version anyway, and only begotten. In other words, it's like the sort of favour you see to the favoured child who is the only son, like that. I'm not saying he's the only son. I'm saying his, his glory and his, his fullness and confidence and so on, his personality is like a son that's um, an only begotten son. 
You know, he's had all the attention of mum and dad there. He's spoiled, you might say, in worldly terms. Yeah. But we don't mean he's spoiled here. We mean he's a wonderful example of a son. Yeah, I think that's the drift, isn't it? So I take it that we, we're talking specifically about Jesus here. He's a son, like we're sons and so on, perhaps, but I mean, you know, it's not the issue here. Um, he's a fine, full of grace and truth. Just like this Logos. Now the Logos is not a physical person. It's a spirit being. It's the nearest we have to the manifestation of God. No one's seen God. But they have through um, earnest uh, introspection and so on, found a wisdom which, um, in the uncertainty of all things, accredits God with existence says, you know, and God would be like this, full of grace and truth. And, and it's this wisdom that, is the, that we have, that is so valuable to us, perhaps. You won't know unless you've got it or you see it. Unless it's been manifested to you, but um, the Greek mind takes it that in some sense, some measure of wisdom's in all life, it is what life is. Because without some wisdom, well, you don't survive from morning to evening even. You know? <laughs> You've got to have some understanding of and, and hope and uh, all, all those intangible things that make up what we associate with being a living person, a living being. You know, hope that dynamizes you to have action and uh, thought that gives you the imagination to perceive or conceive of what action could be feasible and how to uh, perhaps attain it. You know, I'm, I'm thirsty, so I go and get some water and drink. You know, it's all about I have the hope that this will work if I, because it has done before, I've seen it, I've experienced it, or mum's given me a drink, or whatever, you know, whatever story you like to put to it in that way. So God himself may not have been manifest to anyone, but the wisdom of his existence is manifest, and it's been made manifest in this person that we're going to talk about called Jesus. And uh, yes, we are talking about as if he were real, if he, as if he's a, a living story, a being, you know, but we are in the story if we are Greek, if we are in keeping with everything else of the mystery cult that this story is going to have, including the very words of all sorts of equivalent characters in those cult records, stretching back to, from our point of view, the beginning of semi-recorded time, <laughs> be it ancient Egypt or even earlier, who knows. So the nearest I get to a manifestation of God is the wisdom. And the wisdom is made particularly clear to us in certain individuals, if you like, the godly, the saints, the, the, um, the extraordinary people in history that seem to have this spirit of God, this wisdom in them far more than the rest of us. And that might, you might narrow down to only those of, uh, the Christian understanding or only those of the uh, Judeo-Greek world combined or those of the East and West world combined as well. You know, you're then talking about Krishna and perhaps Buddha and, 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 and so on and so forth. There are these um, 
uh, persons of fabled history, I think probably the best way of drawing to it, that draw attention to the possible imagination around a person that personifies this wisdom. That's not to say that God isn't a person just as you are a person, but only that in physical terms he's not manifest other than through these um, sketches of persons. So presented, be they Jesus or what. David Bolton in his book draws attention at the right time, I think, to that which is understood. That especially our habit from something like the 17th century onwards of putting a capital S for son uh, to distinguish, say, Jesus from, or, or the Holy Spirit uh, from um, son with a lowercase s because we're all sons of God in some sense, or those who believe are sons anyway, uh, if not everything that God has made is in some sense a son, in, 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 the, in the sense that he, he is, it is God that's the author and creator of all. Let me just, uh, in passing, pull out on page 111 of my copy of David's um, The Trouble with God, which is... Um, on page 111 then, um, he th takes it that um, John's writing is strongly influenced by the Hellenized Judaism of Philo, P-H-I-L-O, Philo. Um, We're in the first complete paragraph of page 111, sort of halfway through it. And he's emphasizing there, um, um, the beginning of time, there was the Logos in the um, Hellenized um, Judaism of Philo, uh, the Greek philosopher's term for the principle of reason and wisdom, the word or language by which chaos is ordered and made intelligible. You know, in the beginning was the word, and the word was going breathes on the chaos in the creation story of Hebrews, and brings order, and it's wisdom that understanding and it's something of that. You see, the logos was with God, and it was God. He or it was the creator of all things. He was life. Life is in the spirit, you see, the Lord, the giver of life. And this life was the light of men. And really that's the foundation, isn't it, of what I would have thought should have been Christian understanding. Um, but somehow got overshadowed by this desire to have a person who's tangibly historical, um, you know, this departure from the mystery, Hellenized mystery cult view that is actually n n not just um, a story, but Jesus is an historic person and of course came to take it that he was God, he is the God. We don't actually say Jesus is God the Father, you know, we have a bit of a problem there and, and we've struggled with the Trinity and all the rest of it. And I think the struggle has been a consequence of this. Great simplicity, of, it's easier to love Jesus, this um, storied man, than it is to visualize God that hasn't been manifest in all his fullness to us. And if he did, or if he has, we're not up to a consciousness of such. <laughs> so the Christian church has ended up worshipping Jesus. It was convenient, possibly for rulers, 
to have that as the official view too. But it's a departure from the truth um, or the wisest thing to do. And we knew that already because we'd been told from time immemorial that thou shalt love God, um, the one God, all heart, soul, mind and strength. And John, I feel, keeps that consistency in that, yes, we, no man's seen God, but wisdom has it. Wisdom has it of his existence and how he would be. And this is the only thing that can teach you. This thing we, this understanding we call wisdom should be your one and only guide. But the Greek took to be the pursuit of truth. Platonically, there is a pure for form beyond it, which is God in all his fullness. But the nearest we can get to his manifestation is the Holy Spirit. In some sense, something less. Well, children are something of their parents, but less while they're children. So we experience the Holy Spirit in this way. And of course, what we're saying is we experienced it very strongly and beautifully in, in this particular story of Jesus, this personage. So that's what we look to. So life eternal is knowing thee, which is receiving the wisdom of God and Jesus Christ, through whom we have understood that wisdom to be the way to go. He points to it and says, I send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit, wisdom. You know, suddenly you'll, you'll, you'll get it. You'll, you'll realize it's within you, that he dwells in you as I dwell in you. And God the Father dwells in you because he dwells in me, he dwells in you. And so forth and so forth. I think I'm going to give it a rest there for a minute because it's full stuff, isn't it? Thank you, Dad. Look at the fantastic wisdom here. Grace is coming out in the very theology itself. That it's understood we don't, we haven't seen God as such. Um, but there's the Holy Spirit wisdom which leads us to infer God. And well, we're in we're in, we're in thought here, and you know, how much wisdom have we got? We're going to be making mistakes left, right and centre, aren't we? You know, both willful given our inclination and um, by negligence and by mistake. And we need to have this relationship, don't we? That we can trust in the grace of God to cover us, to love us, in spite of what we're going to get wrong. I mean the things I've got wrong already in, in this recording that I'm not aware of, say, or, you know, I'm vaguely aware of, but can't quite manage to put my mind to coping with that aspect in passing. We have here already, in its very self, something of the grace that we are seeking in wisdom. And, and, you know, as I've touched on here, that grace seems to be fundamental to love. Not a legal, a legality justice. But what I think the medieval tried to achieve in England, um, the king's justices travelled around the country to bring equity I'm not certain, because I, I, I did study law, but only at a low level, you know. I did well in it, but that's all you could say. Um, but in some sense, the king's justice would put right justice that had been too legalistic or, or gone wrong in some sense. You could appeal 
to the king's magistrate when he came. And he had authority over your local lord in that sense because he speaks for the king. <laughs> oh, and even the lord now is, hmm, okay, I have to do this because the king's minister, um, um, ju justice. Uh, and so he brought equity, fairness, understanding, um, it wouldn't have been called love, but tried to put things right where the system was failing. And, and, and if you think of it, Paul's thing, you know, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. Paul's trying to live that reality too, that it's far more attractive to him. I mean, simply heavenly that there's something wonderful about grace which puts right what the law can't do. And as I pointed out, probably was it in the previous recording, when grace is extended towards us and we know it, it has a transforming effect on us that we just want to love him for it. We are so grateful so thankful to be rescued. We are transformed, born again by his grace extended to us. The love of our parents, the love of God. So we start to see very early on, if we're looking hard, I suppose, but the importance of what's going to come in John 17, of seeing God as dad, someone that loves us, not just someone who's incredibly capable, powerful, and all-knowing and all the rest of it, but actually loves us and extends grace to us in our, in our inadequacy of being young, children, n not wise yet, not fully conversant in um, knowing him, his true nature, his true values. And this is life eternal, isn't it? To know thee, John 17, and Jesus Christ, which is the sort of visible story evidence of how a person it's going to be living your example. Um, you'd live as if you were an only begotten son. One who has had the full attention and love of the parents. One for whom the parents, it's their reason for living. You are their reason for living. Their only son, their only child. This is an astonishing love story, isn't it? I mean, real love. God's love. To us. You and me. Love you, God. Love you, Heavenly Dad. Love you. Love you. Love you. Thank you, Dad. Ah, Heavenly Father, it's such a joy to have you speak these things through me, to experience this having happened, and so often happens. And I, I seldom expect it coming, see it, seldom see it coming. Not for me alone, but it's for all of us. The whole point of the story is that this Holy Spirit is in you and me and opens our understanding which leads to life eternal or is even life eternal. We're in the miraculous in that way. We are in 
in in gaining under if you're gaining wisdom and understanding of God, it's because you're being taught of the Holy Spirit. Um, something of truth and wisdom is coming through to you from somewhere. Not necessarily what you're listening to at the minute, say, or you know, it just it dawns on you. You think, ah, oh, I've got it. Like I was hit this morning by, oh, it's grace again. I mean, only a, within a few minutes ago, wasn't it? That I've been recording something on grace and struck by grace, and now I'm seeing it here in chapter one of John's Gospel. And, and you know, there's all this chat about the baptism from the Synoptic Gospels, you know, the other three, but John's Gospel, the only thing on John seems to be John one fifteen to 18. And what have we got here? For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But verse 7, just before it, And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace, which is, a, I think, a way of saying grace upon grace, immense amount of grace upon grace. Torrents of grace we receive from our loving Dad, Heavenly Father. And we've all received it. It's that which gives us existence in the first place. He's the Lord, the giver of life. Comes via this understanding, wisdom. You know, right from the very beginning we start to cotton on something nice happens to us when mum's face appears before me. Um, I get rescued from my difficulties. We experience the grace from early on, don't we? Um, perhaps not even visually, perhaps we just feel the warmth of mum. And it's associated with, um, oh, that's what I needed, you know, the closeness of, because I've been created in mum and, and are used to her temperature and warmth and, and softness, I don't know. I mean, you know. Um, but how amazing here that John says so little about this baptism thing, and yet he's got this very essence of the love of God in grace, I think. Let me just read those four verses to you. Verse 6, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Verse 7, And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. Verse 8, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not clear that verse 8 is actually being said by in the story John the Baptist, but the writer explaining verse 7, for we've all received grace for grace, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And even verse 9, you know, are we talking about um, John talking here, uh, John the Baptist, or are we talking about the writer of John's Gospel when he says, no man's seen God at any time. The only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, hath declared him. Now the Son is the consequence of the Father, isn't it? And we are consequent of the Father. We're born of him. And we're just saying that the Holy Spirit is close in the bosom of the Father, and he's declared him. It's words again, isn't it? Words of truth. Words that rescue. Words that have life in them. Um, hope, uh, bring gratitude, peace, joy, assurance, wisdom, understanding. All the list brings all the goodness of God into our being. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Dad.